Okay, so we're live. Welcome back to the Magic Minds podcast. I'm Matt Book. You're listening and watching the Liberty's number one podcast. The best podcast in Dublin. Eh? Yup the Liberties, yup the flats. I've got a fantastic interview for you today. It's with a guy called Jeff Thompson. Jeff is a, a BAFTA award winning writer, playwright, the author of 40 plus books. He's a teacher. He's also described as the most influential martial artist since Bruce Lee. What a bio that is. I was absolutely honoured to get the, the chance to interview him. I reached out to him after I listened to his interview with Brian Rose uh, on the London Reel and it blew me away. I was in tears and seconds as soon as I listened to it. My pal Aoife sent me over and says, have a listen to this. And I absolutely loved it. It was very significant because the night before I was due to start my Mind Your Little Self program that I've designed and I was going to reveal my story. I listened to Jeff's story and it absolutely inspired me to, to follow my passion, follow my truth. A beautiful human being and a gift from the universe. You know, Jeff's story is he, he had a childhood trauma, sexual abuse that caused him a lot of turmoil in his life and he changed that and he, he goes through it beautifully in all the books that he's wrote, the work that he's done and in the interview today, he really brought us to true as well again and i absolutely loved it he's very kind i listened to his books i listened to the interviews i've done a lot of research on him and the commonality to commonality right across the way with him is this honesty truth compassion love and love kindness understanding forgiveness empathy he, he epitomizes kindness and he was really kind he reached out to me he said lovely things about our work and it just blew me away it's lovely to be connected and it really is true what they say what you're seeking you will find and I, i'm seeking out truth i'm seeking out love kindness compassion and i've been gifted with a with a beautiful interview with jeff, Tom, jeff thompson so hopefully you enjoy it as always, I want to thank Noel Riley from Rooney Media Graphics, Andy from Liberty Media Hub, the girls from Shannon's Hope Line, you, the listeners, thanks very much for all your support. Thanks very much for sharing our work on social media and all the, the words of kindness that you send us. I would ask you to help us out. We have a Patreon page. If you can afford the price of a coffee or a pint each month, please do. If you don't, that's okay. If this is free, all the work I do on social media, all the... The wisdoms I share out, all the, the kindness that we're giving out, it's in service of to inspire you to mind your little self and heal yourself through love, kindness, compassion, understanding. But if you want to support us, please do. I'm in the process of putting a book together. I thought you just write a book, print it up, and that's the way you go. Now I have to publish it and I have to, to pay a lot of money. So I'm hoping the Patreon page might be able to help you with that. I suppose it's like when I done the podcast. All I thought I needed was a Zoom H1. I didn't know I needed lights and studio and computer and all this. But look where we are now. Uh, build and they will come. I've got great belief in this book like I have the Magic Minds podcast, Stories of the Power of Transport. Thanks very much. Mind your little self. If anything comes up in this interview, please reach out to me. There's plenty of supports out there. PA The House, Shannon's Hope Line, Mental Health Warriors. Uh, us, if we can support you in any way, point you in any direction. Because there's going to be hurt and trauma spoke about in this interview. So I'll just ask you to mind your little self. Uh, enjoy the interview. Take care. Bye bye. Okay, so we're live. Welcome back to the Magic Minds podcast. I'm Matt Bork. You're listening and watching to the Liberties number one podcast. We're the best podcast in Dublin. Eh? You up the Liberties, you up the flats. I'm absolutely buzzing for our interview today. Today I've got a man on the show called Jeff Thompson. Jeff, what's the crack? How are you, Bab? Good to see you. Absolutely delighted to see you, Jeff. Thanks very much uh, for coming on the show. I'm super excited. I know people are going to absolutely love this. You're such a beautiful human being and a gift to the universe that I, I'm only after discovering through my pal Aoife. So I thanked her last night for the gift and I'm delighted to talk to you. That's lovely. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Guys, I've asked Jeff to come on the show. Jeff is a BAFTA winning award, uh, uh, award winning writer. Uh, 40 books or 40 plus books, uh, playwright, uh, the most influential martial artist since Bruce Lee, which is fantastic. And he's a teacher and a, just a beautiful human being, as I said. And it's just an, an honor to be like that. No, thank you, Matt. I've been looking at some of your stuff and it's, uh, it's just, I love what you're doing. I love, there's, there's, a, there's a great line in the Zohar. <clears throat> which is uh, the Zohar is the commentary on the Torah, the Old Testament. And it says um, the master draws down, the master sets the table uh, for the servant before he eats himself. And, it, and it's an allegory. It means 
that um, if we want to create abundance, if we want to experience abundance, we call it down for people that are in more need than us. And that's what I think you do uh, very beautifully. That's why I'm really honoured to be on your show. Thanks very much, Jeff. And that's exactly what I try to do. And, and I listened to the Brian Rose interview, which was absolutely phenomenal. And it was a divine timing because the day before, that the day after I was due to give a talk, I produced a programme called Mind Your Little Self to, to give people the skills to mind their little self. And in it, I was going to talk about my story, about my sexual abuse. And my friend Eve had sent me a week before your interview. And I only listened to it the night before. And I was like, wow. This is divine timing. Yeah. And, you know, and you talk about that. To be honest, when I listened to the interview, I, I, I slightly uh, got upset and I cried within 10 seconds. And then I listened to it. And just to hear you talk about truth was just phenomenal. Uh, thank you, Matt. Thank you. The, the thing is, is, is that we should never stop telling our stories. I remember teaching in a, in a class one day. And my friend John Anderson, you recognise John Anderson from Watch Me Back, awesome Anderson. He yeah, said yeah. Me, are you, he said to me, are you telling them the stories? And I said, oh, John, they must be sick of hearing my stories. He said, no, you've got to keep telling the stories. He said, every time you tell the story, even if it's the same story, someone will hear something new or they'll hear something from a different perspective, from a different aspect. They may have heard it 10 years ago, but today they'll hear it. They may have heard it yesterday and today they'll hear it and they'll hear another nuance. And that's one of the things I love about the exchange of energy is that when me and you talk together, God serves us both. So I will tell you things I didn't know I knew because they will come from a hidden realm. They'll come from what they call the hidden Torah, the hidden word. So I will be informed just as much as you will be informed. So it's what Charles Handy would call proper selfishness. When we do something for other people, it will serve us. But literally, because I will, I will I'll never really fully know my own knowing until I share my knowing with other people. So oh. that's why it's really important to keep telling your story. I'm, I've been telling my story for 40, over 40 years, and I'm still learning little nuances about what happened, why it happened, what my place for that is and as we know the stories um and I've, I've heard few people deliver stories better than you and kinder than you but our stories have the ability to intercede in people's lives and transform them take them on a different direction and you we we may never meet these people we may never hear from them that doesn't matter all we do is we follow the instruction we tell the story and then we go and have a cup of tea somewhere and we don't think about it again because I don't care. I just want to follow the command. You know, the, the God might do, he might do a billion different things with that message or he might just do one. It won't make no difference to me. My, um, my calling is just to tell the story. And I think I mentioned on the Brian Rose interview that my inner opponent will come up and say, fucking hell, you're getting a lot of mileage out of this. You've told this a few times. That, what You know, when are you going to get past this? You know, when are you going to stop telling this story? When are you going to move on? Um, but what they don't realize is there is arcana in my story. There is hidden secrets that I want to understand. I want to know. I can correct. I can connect to God directly through my wound. That's what I'm going to do. It's beautiful. Is it? It's what Rumi would have said. Uh, the the light shines in through the wound. The wound yeah. opens the door for the. A delight, isn't it? That's where we... Yeah, that's absolutely true. Leonard Cohen, sing the songs you still can sing. Um, forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Wow, wow. And when I first listened to you, Jeff, within a couple of minutes, I was crying. And then your words were, were permeating my soul. They went by my intellect and went straight into my heart. I could feel them. It was like I was wearing them. But then as you were speaking and you were speaking your truth and honesty, I started to reject you. I started to push away. You were irritate me. I was like, fuck him. What does he know? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I knocked the interview off and then I went, what is it about him that's irritating me? What is, what is it in me? And I realized because you were talking truth and honesty and I didn't want to go to some place and I knocked it back on. I was like, OK, open your heart, very open brave. your mind. It's very honest and very brave. Yeah, this, this, like I said, if I, when I, uh, the reason you feel you would have cried 
when you heard me speak is because you'll hear the holy doll through me. It's not me. I make a, I make a myself a, a clean vessel so that that can come through me. Um, and the reason you'll reject it is the same thing because the ego is very, very affronted by the truth uh, because it's going to make it look at certain things. If if you if I can create a, a very close proximity to God, the ego will be dissipated. So lots of people would switch off, especially when you start talking about forgiveness, repentance. You know, when you start talking about you know caught looking at a criminal as a victim as well. Um, nobody really wants to hear that, but actually. I, I'm interested in cleaving to God or cleaving to truth. And to do that, I have to remove the dust. I have to remove everything that isn't truth. So we need to put ourselves in a place that will either spit the ego out or draw it in. So a proximity will do that. Proximity will either draw you in or will spit you out. Either way, I'm a teacher. Because whichever one it does, if you're intelligent like you are, you're going to go away and say, what is it about this guy that's making me reject him? And if you've been drawn into it, you're obviously just ready to hear it. So it's having the courage to go. If it brings up a very uncomfortable feeling, um, then I've drawn out. I've drawn out a hidden parasite that you need to look at, and that hidden parasite stands between you and God. And if there's even one person or one parasite that stands between you and God, then the light is blocked, and we need to create room for the light. So. Um, it gets in through the cracks, as we said. It's painful. It will go in and it will wash up all of these um, old parasites, these old scripts, these old wounds. And, of course, it will sting. It will break them off their moorings. It will stop them from feeding. And we'll have to go, you know, we'll have to recognize them and observe them very quickly and go, what is that? What is that feeling? And then we go, OK, I'm going to go back in and I'm going to have another look. Mm. And I, I love the part and I got into it very quickly where you talked about forgiveness and that absolutely melted my heart because like you, Jeff, I have uh, childhood trauma, sex abuse, and I have forgiveness in my heart for the people that done me wrong. I forgive and, you know, I believe that they are too hurt. They are hurt too or been hurt, although yeah. that's not that's not OK to do that. But to hear you say it, it, but yeah. Yeah. No, but I have a lot of forgiveness, and you, you started off your interview by saying that you know, with the with the the person that uh, abused you. Could we talk a little bit about your life and the build up to that to give people a, a picture of what life was like for you? Yeah, I guess my story started proper when I was at junior school, and I'd got this massive ambition to create. I was a creative soul. I wanted to do things in the world. You know, I was I was very energetic very trusting, hugely sensitive. You know, other kids were at school writing five lines. I was writing 15 pages. I was a creative. It was in me. Um, then there was a big martial arts phase, and I got really excited about the whole Bruce Lee thing. So I joined a local martial arts club. I didn't know, I didn't really know what martial arts, what different martial arts were, only that there was no karate about at the time or kung fu. It was just an Aikido class. And I joined this class, and I was the star of this class. I loved this class. I loved the teacher. I idolized him. Um, and I didn't realize until afterwards, of course, that I was being groomed. I didn't realize. And, and to be honest with you, I would probably say that this teacher didn't realize he was grooming me either. He probably th thought he was nurturing a, a relationship because he was, I can see in retrospect, he was a grown man, but he was very damaged. So this... This guy grew me for a year, and at the end of this year, I was sexually assaulted during this, uh, um, this night where we all stayed over at the club and we were all mm -hmm. helping to fix mats and get the gym uh, cleaned and all that kind of stuff, and I was sexually assaulted. I, I don't remember much. I only remember the terror and the terror that stayed with me for the next 40 years. I just remember waking up with my pyjamas open, my genitals exposed, and the weight of an, an invisible hand, because this there was two people sharing this camp bed, and the weight of this invisible hand on my bottom, on my legs, and on my genitals, and the terror. I mean, I'm 11. I've only been in the world for a very short time. I am absolutely naive. I've not even kissed a girl yet. I don't understand any of this. Um, and I know that it's this teacher and his friend, and I know that I have been abandoned I've been betrayed. I also know later, in retrospect, that that's not what they would have thought. They would have thought that I understood it 
and that I was keen and that I, you know, that I would, I, I'd kind of led them on to it. This is what they would have rationalized. Um, and, uh, but it was just terror. And I can just remember this sense of fighting this hand away, having to, I don't know where it came from, but something in me picked the hand up and took it away. And then it kept coming back. I didn't realize until again until I started to write about it that I've been trying to escape that invisible hand for 40 years afterwards by making myself into a into a tank by making myself into a an elite martial artist by learning to kill in 30 different languages broken nose cauliflower ears get rid of all the prettiness I'm not a girl I don't want to look like a girl. I looked like a girl when I was a kid. I looked like a little girl. And I thought the reason I've been abused is because I look pretty. So I got rid of all the prettiness. I covered my body in war paint, um, all this war paint, all, my, all of my legs. I didn't realize all of my legs where the hand would have originally invaded. On my legs, I've got huge tattoos of samurai warriors there to protect me. I didn't know I was even doing that. My back is like wings. I've got a huge back. This attack came from the back. So I've built this armory to protect myself from this invisible hand. It would have helped if I could have seen what was happening, but I was too terrified to turn around. I was so afraid. I didn't just feel abandoned by uh, this person. I felt abandoned by my parents. I felt abandoned because they left me there. Even though I begged to stay there, I felt abandoned by God. I've been brought up a Christian, so why has God let this happen? I was mostly dissonant. I was young, didn't understand it. I woke up in the morning. I don't know what happened for the rest of the night. It's gone. I've never, ever been able to retrieve it. And I, I guess that's a blessing. I don't know. I only know I woke up the next day and this man's face was like that. His nose were, and his lips were touching my lips. I woke up to this face on my face. And even at the age of 11, I knew he was pretending to be asleep um, and that he'd just woken up like that by, by accident. I was so afraid. I was absolutely so afraid. I, was, I can remember the darkness in my body. I can remember knowing that I went to bed as an 11-year-old and I woke up and I was 100. And that's how I felt. I felt like I was 100 years old. I knew my childhood was over. At some point during the morning, he was joking and laughing about like nothing had happened. And he said, oh, you're a bit quiet. And I, I had the courage to say somebody was touching me in the night. And he laughed and said, oh, it's probably just your imagination. Like I'm an 11-year-old boy and I'm going to be projecting that kind of abusive um, imagination and I started crying and he realized immediately he was in trouble he immediately he immediately realized and he hit himself and he spent the next little bit of time saying to me you know how your parents are you know how vigilant they are don't tell them they wouldn't understand you're very special there's something special about you what he was basically saying was you're gay um, and this was a relationship and and um you know, I was 11, I was a boy, I understood none of this, I understood none at all. So, uh, but he didn't have to, he didn't have to talk me too much into not telling my mum and dad, I'm like, I, I'm like you, I've been brought up as an Irish Catholic or a, a, in an Irish background, you know, we were more afraid of shame than we were of as an assassin's bullet. Oh, 100%. So there was no way, there was no way I was going to tell anybody. So I buried this secret deep. And of course, what happens when you bury a seed, it grows, you know. And then over the next 40 years, I, um, I physically abused myself. I sexually abused myself. I didn't even know I was doing it. I wouldn't have even known what it was. I only knew that it was a secret part of my life that grew. Even when I got married and had kids, this was going on where nobody else knew. All I knew was that it was happening and I was deeply deeply ashamed of it and the shame was killing me and this this shame and this parasite had a voice and it would say you're a piece of shit you led him on you made this happen this is your yeah. own fault and look at you look at what you're doing to your body look how you're raping yourself look at look at how abusive you are to yourself you enjoy this you wanted this what are people going to think 
what are people going to think of you when they know what, how dirty and how vile you are? This is the voice. So that's why eventually it could trigger lots of depressions, you know, where, where, where the depression would come in with a voice and literally wipe me out for three months at a time. You know, it was, and, it, and I can't tell you how painful it was to wake up at four in the morning in a cold sweat with my wife asleep next to me, with my children asleep in the other room and thinking it's going to be a long day. Can't talk to my wife. I can't talk to my wife, Matt, because she is afraid of my depression. Um, I can't talk to my family. I can talk to my mum. My mum has got an idea because she suffered with depression and she's able to talk to me a little bit. I can't talk to the doctor because he just wants to put me on tablets. And I tried tablets and I <coughs> felt like I was underwater. I felt so dull. I just knew it wasn't for me. I couldn't turn to God because God abandoned this happened if God didn't abandon me. These were my juvenile thoughts running around my head. And I just had this moment of clarity. I would say it was uh, my first real communion with my soul when I just said, I'm not having this anymore. I'm not having it. I can't live like this. And I just had this idea to immediately draw a pyramid on a piece of paper, write down my fears on each step of the pyramid, my least fear on the bottom step, my worst fear on the top step, and confront them till I had no fears at all. And that's what I started to do. And I started to find certainty. All of these little fears that were keeping me in a small terraced house, in an unhappy marriage, in a menial job, with a menial mindset, and all of this stuff that was keeping me in a frightened, perceptual prison, I started to confront. It ended up where I became... My final fear was a fear of violent confrontation. So I did the only thing you could sensibly do if you have a fear of violent confrontation. I took a job as, as a bouncer in one of the roughest nightclubs in Europe. <laughs> and then, uh, that was my idea. I'll go on, I'll become a bouncer, I'll confront my fear of violence, I'll put a little tick on the top of my pyramid. My pyramid of fears is gone and I'm free. I recognise that my freedom lay beyond that line of fear. So I went on the door, uh, and I've told this story a few times, but I realised immediately it wasn't for me. I was, God, I've never been so afraid. It was like Sodom and Gomorrah and Pompeii all mixed into one. It was glamorous, it was exotic, there was beautiful creatures there, but there was also monsters, there were proper monsters. It was like all the monsters in my head had manifested in front of me, and they were queuing up outside this... <laughs> the roughest nightclub in the roughest city in Europe. And it was, it was kind of um, seductive and, a f and frightening at, at all at the same time. And the guys I, were work, I was working with, Matt, were gladiators. You oh, know, I, li gladiators. I, I listened to that book, Watch Me Back. I've, yeah. I've only a couple more hours left to have it on Audible and I've been living it. But what stands out to me uh, uh, is that although you were working on the door, uh, Jeff, and you're with all these monsters. You, 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 you were the absolute paradox. You, you, you embraced violence, hurt, pain, but you had this loving kindness about you. It you was defend. still there. Yeah. 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 It was like, and every bit of work I've watched you in, you do, you can do it. It's like the Tao. You're the dark and the light. You know, you embrace the love. Like, I mean, I, what, I listened to one piece where you were, absolutely violent with someone and then you are very tender to one of the customers are very tender to one of them and going wow that's amazing yeah it was um i i i later fell in love with a guy called george hackensmith this was my ideal man and i always thought that's what i want to aim for and george hackensmith was hugely articulate massively didactic you know he was an autodidact he was self-educated he could speak several languages. He wrote books, but he was hugely physical. And I love that polarity. I thought it was quite rare. Yeah. So I, I like that, uh, that idea of being able to be, have a physical presence, but be extremely gentle. So have such a fat physical prowess that there's never, ever any need to use it. So I kind of always loved that idea. And that's what I aimed for. But as you know, from listening to the story, I did become very violent myself and I can't rationalize that i can't justify it and i won't you know i was i was creating monsters in the world and then i was 
developing techniques to to defend myself against the very monsters I'd created and forgotten. So I became, I went on the door, you know, to overcome my fear of violence, but I became very violent myself. And yeah. it was only much later after nearly killing somebody that I turned back inwards again and started to examine, you know, why I felt the need to live a violent life. Because although I was physical and I was having fights, that gentleness just wanted to come out. Yeah, I felt I was I, on the door to protect myself and to protect the customers from that negative minority. And, and that was always what, 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 um, what really drew me towards that world. But I realized I was, I was contributing more darkness than light because I was being violent. I was no Kissinger. I was, you know, if the situation got uh, a bit too difficult for me intellectually, I just be, went physical. That was my means of discourse. I, I, used, I used physical, my fists and my feet and my head to solve problems. And that's yeah. not something you can do in an intelligent society. No. I'm, I'm interested in, I'm interested in being a, vessel for true power that and that is you know that's kind of the that ability to have a fight is the very kind of lowest level of um power you know i wanted the, i wanted to have the ability to be as to be so powerful to have such a powerful proximity that that violence couldn't even enter into my um into my atmosphere and the only way i could do that would be to find the singularity within me that quantum vacuum that geometric point the self or the soul as they would call it in, in hinduism um the atman and connect this absolute so i recognized that the true power wasn't the ability to lift a weight or throw a punch it was the ability to remove everything that prevented you from finding a proximity and sit in that proximity and exist in that proximity and the christians mm -hmm. would call it to be in constant prayer the Buddhists would say it's about finding the still center. Um, they, in Judaism, they would say it's about returning home. It's about re refu um, repentance and repair is about return. It's about recognizing we've fallen astray and returning back to the center. And if we have damage in our life or if we've done damage, we are away, we're away from that center. So there's no power there because it's all we, we are li actually live. If we're living away from our center, if we're not connected to God, we have no power at all. You know, we're like a small uh, transistor trying to exist on a tiny battery when we really, we've got, you know, we've got the mains electric available to us. Yeah. So this is about me letting go of my little tiny human battery and trying to click back into the mains electric. And to do that, I had to remove all of the things um, that were not God. They call it apophatic theology. The, the way of, uh, it's, it's about finding God through negation or finding the center by removing everything that's blocking our view to the center. So in Buddhism, they say there are no problems. There is just a, the only problem is believing there's a problem. But they said, but there is a clear view. There is an obscured view and a clear view. So if our view is obscured by anger, by resentment, by envy, by greed, by violence, by judgment, by dissonance, a lot of people are their views com is blocked by confusion. Um, if, there, if anything's blocking our view, then we have to remove those things. And when we remove those things, we we'll reveal what was already there, the constant, the absolute. So that's why I continue to tell my story is because like I'm talking to you now, I'm, I'm like a I'm like a pin in a crab shell pulling out the last little bits, the last little juicy bits of sin so that I can get a clearer view to God or a, or a clearer connection or I can cleave better. So it's, it's all about it's all about me telling the story and telling the story with as much honesty as I can summon um, so that I can even remove the shame of the story. Because obviously we, a lot of us wow. don't tell our story because of the shame. So if we remove the shame, of course, shame blocks us from God. Yeah. Blocks us from our potential. And that's something that shone very brightly from you when I listened to you or watched your TED Talks or any of the work you did and the interview with Brian Rose. You were honest and open and vulnerable and true, and that comes across, and that made it very accessible to me. You know, it felt that you were being genuine. And even in the book, you know, Watch Your Back, there was a great honesty in it. 
And I have to say, I was a doorman as well for a number of years. And I was actually embarrassed to say I was a doorman when I was listening to it because I felt like I was just a fucking lollipop <laughs> in comparison to you. But some of the some of the wit that you wrote in it, you know, was just had me in stitches. Uh, you know, what the, one of them was uh, uh, release the beast in a priest and a few of these uh, uh, little boys cracks. I just I just loved that. And your, your style of writing was beautiful, although it was painful was very honest and vulnerable and you could see the love and kindness in you it, it was it was a spectacular read ah thank you thanks very much well that was the <clears throat> that book was the very first uh, round of cleaning for me because of course yeah. if you're going to write an honest book and you're going to tell the truth you're going to hear the truth aren't you i can tell you the truth all day long but i can't tell you without hearing it and if i hear it i've got if i say to you listen you know uh, you're talking about control but you're forced down overweight so i've got to look in the mirror and say, well, am I, am I, you know, have I got control of my body weight? Have I got control of my palate? So I, I could say to you, um, you know, if I, if I notice something in you that's an obscuration, I'm going to notice that same thing in myself if it's still there. So the great thing about talking the truth is that you invite other people to tell you the truth as they see it, but you also hear the truth. Um, so when I wrote the book, it was very difficult not to bump into the violence especially each time I did a reprint and did a rewrite and learnt and expanded, I was able to see more and more. And it wasn't very nice when I recognised that I'd become a bully. I know people perhaps wouldn't sit, have seen me as a bully, but I know I was. I know I was insecure. I know I was afraid. And even when I was knocking four people out a night, I knew that there was this insecure kid hiding in there somewhere and I also knew that there was a soul in there that was um, tortured by my violence. I absolutely, this is one thing I have no doubt about, I am certain that my soul was tortured by my violence. Um, and the moment the soul is tortured by violence, by vice, it gets out, it jumps out. And then your body is, is an open shop for any invading parasite, any roaming lion that's looking for somebody to take a free meal off. I was able to see this mostly because I, mostly because of the writing, because the writing, you know, brought me in contact with that. Um, and mostly because of the martial arts, because uh, I was starting to reach senior levels in martial arts or starting to tip into the Budo, which is the esoteric martial arts. So you've got the revealed martial arts, which is what you see in every sports hall up and down the country. But then you've got the hidden martial arts, which is the esoteric end. And the Terry Ken was saying to me, you think you're a master, but you still, you've still got an, an addiction to sexual pornography. You're still sexually abusing yourself. That's not an easy thing to say, Matt, but I was. You're still doing this and nobody knows about it, but you're doing it. Um, you're contributing to the sexual abuse of people when you watch sexual pornography. All of those kids on those films are abused by the film by the energies pervading the film, by the energies consuming the film, by the energies producing the film. Those are damaged kids. They're all somebody's, they may be adults, but they're all somebody's children. You are contributing to that abuse when you go on the internet and you consume it and you let these vampires across the threshold. These were the things I was starting to see. And it was saying, you think you're a master. You think you have control because you've got a big right hand. But you haven't. You can't even, you know, you can't even, you can't even control the tidy in the bath. You know what I mean? You can't even control your own appetites. You can't stop yourself from having an extra pudding. You can't stop yourself from having a third or fourth beer. You can't stop yourself from assassinating your friend's character over a coffee at Costa. You know, you think you're a master, you know, and it kind of, I remember looking in the mirror one day and this reflection come out and went, slap, slap. I'll give you my glove, sir. You know, it was like... <laughs> <laughs> you're not you're not a master you're not a master you can have a fight um and the writing showed me that the writing said oh god all these people think i'm somebody but i absolutely know i'm nobody i absolutely know that i have no power at all and it was because my proximity was off there somewhere in the south pole you know i should have been in the very center in the very proximity and when I saw that, when I started to experience it, I became very excited about trying to develop a stronger proximity, certainty. 
that's what I loved. I remember, I remember, um, I remember someone invited me to a church one day, and I felt a compulsion to go. This was, wasn't that long ago, and they got a priest coming over from uh, from Africa, and I just felt a compulsion to go, even though the kind of worship they were doing wasn't really my style. I, I, I live and breathe God, and but I've got my own particular method of doing it. But I knew mm. I'd been called to go. And I must have waited for half an hour for this guy to come on. And he was a black guy. He was little. He was quite stout. But fucking hell, when he started to speak, he was so beautiful. And do you know why he was beautiful, Matt? Because he was certain. I, felt, I literally felt God speaking through him. The certainty was so attractive. It was so beautiful. But you have to have a lot of confidence. You have to have... Uh, you have to have real connection to be certain. Because people say, uh, I'm not interested in talking to you if you're certain, because there are no certainties. It's absolutely not true. I, I am certain about my connection with God. I feel it. And if I get out of the way, it will come through me. And it's so beautiful. I remember looking at this guy and thinking, that's all I want. All I want is that certainty. And the only way to get rid of this, to, the only way to uh, connect to certainty is to get rid of all the uncertainties, get rid of all the negatives. So the writing really helped me to do that. The, and of course, you know, you write a book like Watch My Back, you are noticed. People want to talk to you. They want you to qualify what you've written. They want you to explain how and try to justify violence. And of course, you know, and it goes about a layer deep and you can't justify it. You, you can't justify it because it's just, you know, it's the lowest kind of level of intelligence when you have to revert to a physical assault. Mm -hmm. Our proximity should be so strong that it can't even exist in our world. So that, that, you know, that became really exciting and I started to, the, the book kind of took me around the world and I started to bump into people who would mention, it would, I, I went to Germany and somebody mentioned the Bhagavad Gita and I said, what's the Bhagavad Gita? And he goes, oh, it's a Hindu Bible. And I went and got it and I just couldn't believe, I couldn't believe that this guy 5,000 years ago, Arjuna Pandava and, and Lord Krishna were talking about my life in Coventry. 5,000 years ago. And then I picked up, someone mentioned uh, one of the disciples of St. Paul 2,000 years ago. And I remember thinking, I might have a look at that because I'm struggling with some problems. I'm wrestling with some problems. And I picked up this obscure book by a pupil of St. Paul. And it was like, it was like, he, it's like I'd sent him a message and he'd received, and he sent me an, um, a letter back. And I read the book and it was like a letter to me, directly to me saying, this is what your problem is, this is the solution. And uh, I, so I started to get introduced to all of these hidden works that were always there, but I'd, but I'd never looked at them before, because why would I look at them? Because when I was 11, God abandoned me. Well, I'm not interested in God. I'm not interested in a deity that allows something like this to happen to me. So, of course, eventually this led me to having a confrontation with God and, me saying, and, and God saying to me, speak your mind. You think I abandoned you? And I said, yeah, I think you did. And he said, I didn't abandon you. He said, but did you abandon you? I remember thinking, God, yeah. I've been abandoning myself for 40 years. He just said, ask me anything, accuse me of anything. And when I started to bring up a question, it would die in the air before it even reached my lips because it couldn't qualify itself. But it allowed these unqualified fears to live in me for 40 years because I was too afraid to voice them. So they just fed on dissonance. They fed on ignorance. They fed on lies. But when I started to say to God, or whatever you want to call it, the omniscient, the omnipotent, the omnipresent, the universe, my questions were answered as I was asking the questions. Or, they, or as I went to voice them, I recognized how ridiculous they were. I remember saying to him once, why do you let these things, these terrible things happen to children? And he said, um, you know, let me ask you the same question. Why do you allow it to happen? Why, do you, why, do, why does the human race allow it to happen? Why are people um, assassinating in, in each other every single day? If you, if you commit an error and fall out of alignment and disconnect from kindness and you do even a little sin or just a little bit bigger of a sin, you've disconnected from grace and that, that sin accumulates in a fatberg that eventually ripples out and touches everyone you've never met in the whole world. You drop a pebble in the pond 
and the ripples will reach everybody. And he said to me, every human being is responsible for every atrocity in the world. You have free will. You've given your will over to addiction. You've given your will over to judgment. You've given your will over to unkindness. You've given your will over to accumulation. You've given your will over to violence. You've, you know, you're watching, you're watching violence. Um, you li you're listening to 20 violent stories on the breakfast news before you even eat your cornflakes. He said, I, you're asking me, I'm asking you. You want free will, I've given you free will. And every single thing you do contributes to the fatberg of karma in the whole world. If you don't want people to be hurt and abused in parts of the world that you can't even see, stop sinning locally. Stop hurting people at Costa when you're having a coffee. Stop having judgments about people. And start to recognize that everybody is a victim of something. Even the person that abused you was a victim of something. Of his upbringing, of a similar crime that he experienced, of his teaching, of his culture. You know, he's a victim of something. You look at the kids in America at the moment, the amount of black kids in prison in America at the moment. They are still victims of slavery from 200 years ago. Yeah, generational pain. Yeah, with the rover policed, they're, they're put into prison, you know, for longer sentences. They're treated as as um, as minorities. It, it may be unconscious, but there is nobody, Matt, that is not a victim. Now, as you said at the beginning, that doesn't condone a crime, but it says to us, listen, some of these people I've talked to in prisons, I've talked to a lot of kids in prison, they are assailed by the most tremendous forces of negativity. You want them to resist these murderous forces and you can't even resist a second pudding. You can't even resist a third glass of wine. You're not meeting your own standards. So all of that stuff's going on, we understand that. But why don't we start by getting your own shit in order first? When you can get yourself into balance, when you can get yourself into proximity, when you can resist the, the, you know, if you want this guy to resist the Satan of his murderous intent, at least have a go at resisting the tiny little devils of habit that you have every single day. So we have a responsibility to, um, uh, we have a responsibility to be, if we can, to go out every day and at least try to be a saint, at least try to not be unkind to anybody. And that might not seem like a very big thing to do, but those little things, Again, the good little things accumulate and they act as a they act as a caustic to all the negativity. So if you want to help somebody in a distant country, start by being kind in your own household. Start by start by being kind in your own sub vocalization to yourself. Oh, absolutely lovely. And that kind of leads us on to my next question. I watched uh, Romans twelve twenty yeah. and it blew my mind. I watched him work on my lunch break and I cried for the the 20 something minutes it was on you know uh, if i can get this quote right it's if your enemy's hungry feed him if he's thirsty give him some water this will shower hot coals on his head is yeah. that correct yeah vengeance belongs to me said the lord and i shall repay so if your enemy's hungry feed him if he's thirsty give him drink for in so doing thou shall heap coals of fire on his head but you know what that means so it means no idea it means, you tell me what you think it means. It means that he will, it, it, it's not for you to, to, to cast vengeance on somebody by giving him kindness, by giving him love. He's not used to that. And that in itself will, 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 uh, will I don't know, imprison him. It will yeah. cause him harm. That, I probably had a little bit of a, a, a stuck piece with that. Is that yeah. inadvertently revenge? Yeah, it, it, it is a it, it is the ultimate revenge, but it's yeah. it's not. But it's it's revenge in the fact that well, there's, there's a few things going on, but the main thing is that we're recognizing that God is reciprocity. So He said, "Vengeance belongs to me." In other words, vengeance belongs to reciprocity. So there is a law of compensation, cause and effect. It's a basic scientific law. Mm. For every action, there's an equal opp opposite reaction. Opposite reaction. So nobody, nobody escapes the consequence of their crime. So if we give that crime over to, to, to reciprocity, eventually God will level the hills and fill the valleys. So when it says, if he's thirsty, give him drink. If he's hungry, feed him. It basically means, like when I met my abuser and I forgave him, I told him the truth. So the drink and the food is offering somebody that's placed themselves in your proximity, it's offering them truth. 
So instead of them living on this lie and on this rationalization of what they've done, you uh, give them the food and drink of truth, which is you abuse me, um, you can't rationalize it, you damage my life, and I am going to give you over to reciprocity. I'm going to give you over to karma. So the food and the drink is, is an allegory for uh, truth, faith and truth. The faith and truth is that I'm going to tell you exactly as it is, um, and then I'm going to give you over to reciprocity. It also says that when somebody abuses us, they steal something from us. They take a piece of our soul and they replace it with the hot coal of um, abuse or, or a parasite. Over time and space, that creates like a, an intravenous link between us and them. And they feed off that. So every time you think about them, you fall into dissonance, anger, fear, and it consumes your seminal energies and it disconnects you from your source. So when you bump into them and you forgive them, you're basically giving them, you're breaking that bond. You're giving them back over to reciprocity and you are retrieving the part of the soul uh, that they've stolen. But you're also giving them back the abuse. When you give them back the abuse, that is what the, when they talk about heaping coals of fire in his head, it means you're giving them back the abuse they gave you. So this is what you gave me. This is the parasite you placed in me. This is the cognition you gave me, the mistruth. I'm going to give you that back and I'm going to have enough faith to know that the universe will settle this account in its own time without my need to witness it. So I severed the bond so that person could no longer feed off me. Even over space and time, an abuser will feed off you because every time you think about him, it consumes your seminal energies. So I, this is what I did with this guy. So vengeance belongs to me. Reciprocity will settle all accounts. Uh, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he presents himself serendipitously, tell him the truth. Tell him the truth. Have the courage to tell him the truth as it was. If he's thirsty, give him drink. Have, have faith that the truth will dissolve everything. In so doing, thou shall heap coals of fire on his head. In so doing, you will give him back the hot coals of his abuse. You will return the parasite to him and the parasite will consume him. And that's again, fantastic. Yeah. That's, yeah. That, well, that's that the blows. esoteric meaning, yeah. Beautiful. That that's not where I was going. I didn't understand it at that level. That's but amazing. What you were saying was right. It's absolutely right. Kindness is a remedy. Kindness is an attribute of God. Forgiveness is an attribute of God. It dissolves um, negativity. Compassion isn't just when they talk about compassion as an attribute of God, like a hand re reaching out of the universe and massaging your heart. Compassion is a remedy for any kind of negative emotion. So when we find compassion for somebody, we dissolve the link they have with us and we dissolve the hatred. So you are on the right tracks with it. And the, I would like to claim that esoteric meaning is mine, but it wasn't mine. It was gifted me from the Zohar. Um, and the Zohar is a commentary on the Old Testament. And the Old Testament, the five books of Moses, are said to be the blueprint to the universe. And of course, when you read it in the hidden way, not the revealed way. The revealed way is all about the world was built in seven days and, you know, and we sacrifice animals and, and uh, you know, uh, we make animal sacrifices where we make burnt offerings and it, none of it makes any sense. But when you start to look at the esoteric meaning, animal sacrifice means we sacrifice our animal soul. The burnt offering means I use my, my like when I wrote Watch My Back, that's my sin, my burnt offering consumed in the act of writing a book. What I'm doing now is an animal sacrifice. It's a burnt offering. So I am burning up my negativity, any residue I've got in me, and I'm using it as energy, and, and I'm consuming it in the act of making this talk. So when God works through me as in energy and I talk, he's consuming any negative that's left in me. So that's the mean. So when you start to look at the true meaning of what the Bible say, um, it makes more sense. The Bhagavad Gita, for instance. Bhagavad Gita leads on to the Mahabharata. The Mahabharata leads on to the Sri Bhag the Sri Bhag Mag Sri Bhag Magvatam. And that leads on to the Vedas. Five hundred thousand verses. Five hundred thousand verses. And each story says, This is your problem. It's unassailable. You can't fix it. There's one remedy. Return to me. Surrender to me. 
So you go through 500,000 verses and each one says, I'm going to tell you this 500,000 times. And you, think <laughs> not, you think there's not an answer to your problem, but the answer is simple. Return to me. In the still center, everything is known. So it's all about return. And return in the Old Testament, we would call it repentance. And when we say repentance, we go, fucking hell, that's biblical. That's dogmatic. I don't want anything to do with that. But repentance just means repair. So I could say, I could look at you and say, oh, Matt, yeah, you got this little error here, this little burr. We could repair that. And you go, oh, well, that's really good. But if I said to you, you've got to repent, it wouldn't sound quite so palatable. So you look at these esoteric books, you know, um, and people dismiss them. And they do big arguments online about, about the meaning of the revealed books. But they're not talking about the fact that the revealed books are just house ghosts. They're just placeholders. When you go beyond the revealed works and you go into the esoteric meaning, it's endless. It's absolutely infinite. And it is, and it is a full-time, you know, um, fully immersed study. But it's so amazing because each time you, you're learning more and more, you just think, I want to understand this even more. So it's mm. so when you start to look at the true meaning of forgiveness, it's just going uh, let you free yourself from this parasite and give him back over to karma. And if you don't think karma works, you've not looked hard enough. Have a closer look. Have a closer look. Have a look at your own life and have a look at the fact that everything you've done wrong, you've either carried it around like a painful conscience or it's returned to you like a boomerang. We all know that karma works. We all know that reciprocity works. We don't want to acknowledge that it works because it means we've all got to look at the things we're doing wrong. So it's uh, the esoteric meaning to these things is very beautiful, very powerful. Beautiful, beautiful. You, 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 your, your intellect blows me away, your dialect, uh, the books you've read, the people you've met. What has had the most impact on you? What books or people have had the most impact on you and why? If they've that's... All, yeah, they've all had, they've all had, they've all had different excuse me, they've all had different impacts at different times. Um, and I would say the, the most impactful thing that happened to me was when I thought I killed a guy in a match fight outside, outside a pub I worked in. Mm. And that's, what, that's when I opened up and started to really look at stuff. So I thought I'd killed this guy. And, and for this 24 hours, I thought my liberty was gone. And I thought my place in the hereafter was threatened. And I felt disproportionately terrified. So I was at my absolute weakest. And this is something St. Paul says, um, when I'm at my weakest, I'm at my strongest because the ego collapses and it makes room for this other energy to come through. So in other words, I stop relying on my small little transistor battery when I give myself over to the full force of the mains electric. So I have this night of terror thinking I've lost my wife, I've lost my kids, I've lost my liberty. I've lost my grace. I've got no place in the hereafter because I've killed this guy. Um, and I, I was so afraid that I found my knees and I said to God, if you let this guy live, I promise you I'll turn it around. And that this guy did live. And that led me to start to stop working out and start working in. That's when I, start to, I started to, my instructor was no longer an external being. My soul was introduced to me. And I started to get instruction directly from my soul, or what they call the inner tutor. The inner tutor. You hear of inner intuition, don't you? Mm. But the, the in intuition is the inner tutor. It's the soul. So I started to be directed to this book, to that book. Ironically, most of the stuff didn't come until I'd done some work. So I'd, I'd have an invitation: go and speak to these kids in this prison in the middle of nowhere. Go up on your own and talk to these prisons in this cat A prison. Um, and I, I, everything inside me didn't want to go because just for all the usual reasons, laziness and everything else, but also because I knew that if I went up there and told the truth, I would also be in front of the truth. So I'd go to one of these prisons and I'd do a talk. And then on the way out, someone would say something to me just casually, like this one prison I went to, one of the, one of the guards there was st started to talk to me. He was a former priest. And he started to talk to me about eschatology. And I said, I've never heard of eschatology. And he goes, well, you have now. And I went home and I studied it. And, I, and eschatology was like someone opened the door into a warehouse for me, a warehouse full of goodies. So whenever I went and did something, like I went and did this talk in London, I didn't want to go. They paid me a lot of money to do it. 
but I didn't want to go for the same reasons that uh, standing in front of an audience and talking about the truth would dissolve lots of the parasites that were still in me. So I went and did the talk, even though I was sat in a pub beforehand having a coffee and I, could, and I was bent over and I could feel the adrenaline from the soles of my feet to the crown of my head and I just couldn't go, but I made myself go and I talked for two and a half hours and afterwards my wife bought me a 13 volume collection of Swedenborg books um, about the arcana of the Old Testament. And when I read it, I, couldn't be I just couldn't believe how visceral and how real and how true it was. Another time I went and did something else that was very, very difficult. I won't go into it. And um, when I come back, there was um, uh, about a week later, I had a, had a box arrived at my, ha at my door that I could hardly pick up. And it was a 24 volume Zohar. So every time I went and made an animal sacrifice, every time I offered... Every time I did a burnt offering and went and served somebody, I was rewarded with new knowledge. So when I removed and reclaimed an old part of me, it was automatically replaced with doorways and information into new areas. So the books that came, I would guess, I'm just trying to think, the one that's, that seems to have affected me the most, um, which was I read full time for three months. I was reading like eight hours a day was the Zohar, which is a commentary on Kabbalah. And Kabbalah, Kabbalah is a commentary on the Torah, the Old Testament. So this is a commentary on a commentary on a commentary. So it was like really esoteric. And at the very beginning it says, you're going to read this book and you're not going to understand any of it. Read it anyway. You've got to read it like, like the soul's going to read this like it's a barcode. But your ego won't understand any of it and it will try to get you to turn away. So you have to have the self-discipline to sit down every single day for eight hours and read something where the ego is going, this makes no sense, this is stupid, this is rubbish. But I made 70 pages of notes and then after I'd finished the notes, after I finished the books and I did the 70 pages of notes, I reduced the 70 pages to 20 pages. Then I did notes on the notes and reduced that to about five pages. Eventually, I, re I reduced it to one line. I reduced 24 volumes to one line, which I won't go into now because it's, it, it, would, it would take an hour to explain it. But, and it was a gift specifically for me. But um, uh, uh, I'll, tell you, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you, but it, I'm not, I don't expect it to make sense because it was a personal message for me. But it was basically great. saying uh, it, the, the whole thing was summed up in in one line, which is the secret is in the breath. The secret okay. is in the breath. And when we breathe in and when we breathe out, we don't just breathe in and out air, we breathe in and out spirit, literally. So when I breathe in, I'm breathing in spirit, beings, proper beings. And when I breathe out, I'm breathing out beings. So it's saying you've got to master your breath. You've got to make your body clean so that it can only receive good spirit. And it said, every time you speak, you release spirit. It goes out into the world and it occupies a space in the world um, and it creates in the world. It's, it is invisible beings that are working in the world. The, the Chinese would call it chi. Japanese would call it ki. Um, Hindus would call it prana. We, the, the Christians and the Judaics and uh, the Muslims would call it, would call it spirit. But it showed me it was only one line, but the one line itself was pregnant with exegesis, with more knowledge. So it's basically saying every time you speak, Matt, you are releasing spirits into the world and they will work. They will work for you or they'll work against you. They will go out and they will return. Are you releasing good spirits when you speak or are you releasing bad spirits? Because either way, they're going to work for you. So the key then became... My whole life now is, is, deter, is determined by that one line. Um, and that one line is every time you breathe in, you breathe in spirit. Every time you breathe out, you breathe out spirit. Are there good spirits or are there bad spirits? Are you, are you breathing in shit from the news on the television or, or from the guy that's gossiping, you know, next to you at, at Costa? Um, and, and are you breathing out stuff that's going to serve the world and serve you? If it's not coming from kindness, don't breathe it in, don't breathe it out. So that one line 
has transformed my life. But I had to, I had to go from 24 volumes down to one line. And then, it, and then it said to me, but this one line isn't the end. You need to study this one line. So you need to understand what breath means. Uh, in, in Latin, they will call it inspirito. I think it's inspirito. Um, and inspirito means contains spirit. So you have to start studying. You have to go down lines of inquiry to start studying what that is. And then I've, I've had lots of relative visions about this. But it's, wow. but it's exciting because it's saying, I know what we're doing now. I know that we are exchanging spirit. So we are exchanging God for God. It's a mm -hmm. pure exchange. It's a, there is a pure function. But if any of us fell into negativity and gossip, we would be releasing, we'd be breathing in negative stuff and breathing out negative stuff. Mm, oh, absolutely beautiful. Now, I wouldn't expect, I wouldn't expect the man on the street to, to, he might think I've gone socks and sandals. He might think of, you know, he might think of, you know, lost my marbles. But I, but I am so certain of it. I, all I lack at the moment is the ability to articulate it a little bit better. I think you're doing a fantastic job. I've, all the work that I've, I've watched over the last few days and listened to, they all have this commonality running through them. And that's charity. And you love to give back. And I was listening to some of your podcasts as well. One about restrictive training, gratitude, anything is possible. There was a lovely story in about a man that paid the rent on a building for you because you gave back to him. Yeah. Uh, and you talk about your daughter as well and gratitude. That seems to be a huge part of your, your, your soul, even in the books that I, I listen to, to have, watch your back. Gratitude, giving back, expecting nothing back in return. Yeah. And I reached out to you and you were so kind and you are giving back to me. It's amazing how that works, isn't it? When you give out yeah. and, and not expect that back. And that's it, what it, you're saying, spirits. Yeah, that's what you're doing. And you're, you sent me a, a voice message and I just heard God in it. I just said to him, well, this is, I've just had the most beautiful message, but it was so congruent. It was such a congruent message. In other words, what you were thinking and saying and doing were all in alignment. I felt it. Um, and again, looking at the Zohar, you know, one of the, one of the big things that Zohar talks about, the Kabbalah is the tree of life. And it said the secret to the tree of life is that uh, we draw down in order to share. So you've got the tree of life and you've got the tree of life and death or good and evil the tree of good and evil is when we draw down abundance it's an allegory but we draw down abundance just for ourselves, and that consumes us and it corrupts us but if we draw down in order to share obviously whatever we draw down has got to be processed through our trillions of cells so everything i draw down for you you know i get to receive and process before i offer it to you so the key is if you really want something you really need something Find somebody that needs it more than you. And we know, that there are, we know that we're gifted because we have been given certainties in certain areas. So um, I draw down in order to reach the kid that's going to watch this, um, John or Pete or Susan or Mary. They're going to watch this and, and it's going to act as an intercessor in their life and take them in a new direction because it's going to give them hope. So I'm drawing down because I absolutely know there are people out there much more needy than me. So the key isn't to draw down for me. The key is to draw down is to find people that are more needy than me, people that need it more than me and draw it down and give it to them. So I've just written a book called 99 Reasons to Forgive. Um, and I wanted to write it because I really I was trying to explain to people the power of forgiveness. And there was areas I wasn't able to articulate. So I asked in a prayer, I said, I really want to be able to articulate this to people properly so that they can see how powerful a remedy is, what a practical, um, what a, you know, what a practical technique it is. You know, I want to be able to show them and explain to them and qualify it. And then one morning in the meditation, this book, this, this voice just says, um, it started off as 13 reasons, 13 reasons to forgive. And I sat down that morning and started writing the book. And then as I was going through it, it said uh, 99 reasons to forgive. And the reason, the reason I said 13 reasons to forgive was because I was inspired by Maimonides and his 13 precepts of grace or his 13 precepts of forgiveness. And Maimonides, Maimonides was this great rabbi. And he talked a lot about forgiveness before offence has been taken 
um, you know, pardon in the aftermath of fear. We all need grace. We can only be forgiven to the level we forgive other people. We, we set the parameter. But then I, when I was writing it, it came in and it just said 99 reasons to forgive. And that was inspired by the Quran. And in the Quran, there are 99 different names for Allah. And each of them is seen as an attribute or a remedy. So it's literally like um, I'm struggling with fear. You draw on the attribute. You draw on, on the specific attribute and it acts as a remedy. It's a medicine. You're struggling with uh, resentment. So you, you uh, draw down the remedy, you know, for compassion. You know, I'm, I'm struggling with, um, uh, you know, maybe I'm struggling with my faith. So you draw down the, the, the attribute of Yaqeem, which is certainty. And God will put you in a position where you can feel certainty. So these are real remedies. Um, and I wanted to be able to find certainty or articulation about forgiveness so that I could say to people, look, you're not letting anybody off. You're setting yourself free. And also, don't forget, you know, you, you've got a grudge against this person, but you've, you know, you've, you've got dead bodies in your own patio. Everybody has. Everybody's got dead bodies under their patio. All of us have got things that we need to look at that, you know, we don't need to be too busy looking at what other people have done wrong. I've got a list of my own jobs to do first, you know. So this book came to me because I asked, I wanted the book in order to share it with other people. So when we draw down in order to share, abundance will come to us. We'll find the way of doing it. If we draw down just for ourselves because we want to be famous or because we're, because um, we want to be rich or, you know, it, we might, we might I'm not saying we won't get stuff. I'm just saying it will never say to us. You know, how many rich people have you met who are just miserable and they're not, and they're not set. They've got four houses and five cars and, you know, the, you know, they've got a beautiful wife at home, but they're not happy because there's not enough. There's, you know, I worked with one guy who was, um, uh, he was, a, he was, a, this is, this is when I was doing a film about drug dealing and I went and met this drug dealer and he was putting 50 million out of the country every six months. And he was the most stressed and happy guy I've ever met. And he said to me, he's actually currently doing two life sentences. But I, he actually said to me, um, he, the, his phone just kept ringing and ringing. And he said to me, when I've got my paper straight, he said, I'm going to get rid of this thing. And then he said, who am I kidding? My, my paper will never be straight. He said, there's not enough money out in, the, out in the world to be able to satisfy me. 100 million a year was bringing through his hub and it wasn't enough. He, he said he was, this is, a, don't think I've told this story, but he told me the story once about, Every so many months, he said, this little kid would come um, and he said, I'd, 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 I'd have a, a brand new hold all and it would be full of money, you know, millions of pounds. He said he was only like a 15 year old kid. He said, and he would get on the train, he'd go to London and it would all be, it would all be um, laundered through India. And he said, you know what I hate? You know what I hate? He said, I have to buy a brand new head bag every time that kid comes. Ten quid. He's bringing in 100 million and he's worried about 10 quid. This guy was absolutely con consumed by the need to accumulate. And I've got to tell you, when I first brought, watched my back out, this guy was an angel to me. This was before he became a criminal. He ran a nightclub. He's the most beautiful man. He was so kind, so funny and so generous. He broke his back to try and help me. He was so lovely and such a philosopher, but just fell in with the wrong people, lost his centre path and ended up as a very, very big drug dealer. And uh, last time I spoke to him, I said, what's the worst thing about being in prison? He said that I'll never see my mum again alive. My heart nearly broke. Wow. When, they say, when they say you can't have compassion for criminals, I absolutely have compassion because I know what he's going through. I know what he's got to go through. And I've done it myself. I've been a criminal. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's this sense that if we draw down um, in order to share with people who are more needy than us, we will get everything we need and we will be sated. There'll uh, be more pleasure in the giving than there will be in, uh, in the receiving. Absolutely. You talk a lot about expanded awareness. One of my greatest reliefs and discoveries along my journey was, was when I became conscious and I broke away from my subconscious. I, I was able to start to see the pain. I was able to start to see the hurt and trouble that I was causing for myself. It's, it's something that people can get great relief on is when they start to build that expanded awareness. 
Yeah. How do they do that? Um, if you imagine that awareness is already there, so consciousness or God is already there, it's already, it's the constant, it's the only thing that's real. It's like this computer screen now. I can look at all the logos and all the images on it, and if I remove all of those, there's a backboard, isn't there? And it, so all of these images and all these icons are fed from a backboard. The backboard is ev always there, even though it's invisible, even though we don't see it. So consciousness is always there. We just have to remove all of the icons, all of the ambitions, all of the, you know, the, um, the, the mistruths, the half-truths, the blood-red lies. We have to remove the vices. We have to remove, you know, our unqualified opinions. This is that sense of apophatic theology again, the sense of contracting in order to expand and expanding in order to contract. So we contract in order to expand by contracting the ego. We take the power off the ego. We take away the vice from our life. We take sovereignty over our body. And then the, the ego becomes a servant to the soul. So we contract the ego. And when we contract the ego, the consciousness expands. We just become more aware because we're not looking through the eyes of the ego anymore. We're looking through the eyes of consciousness or through the eyes of the observer. Similarly, when we meditate or pray uh, or fast, when we do any of these spiritual uh, exercises, our consciousness expands. And as our consciousness expands, it leaves no room for ego. So the, as we expand, the consciousness exp uh, contracts. I remember having a conversation, <clears throat> two conversations, one with Yuri Geller and one with uh, Mahatma Gandhi. Yuri Geller was on the telephone. Mahatma Gandhi was in a meditation. I said to Yuri Geller, how do I improve Yuri? He said, Jeff, you've got to expand. And I knew what he was saying. Then I spoke to Gandhi in a meditation. I said, Mr. Gandhi, how do I improve? He said, Jeff, you've got to make yourself small. Both of them were right. So we make the ego small and consciousness expands. We expand consciousness and the ego shrinks. So we can't expand consciousness without, uh, without contracting the ego. And the best way to contract the ego is to recognize that it's just a servant. It's, it's, it isn't a ruler. It thinks it's a ruler. It thinks it's sovereign. It thinks it, 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 thinks it has any control. It doesn't. It needs to just be the servant of the soul. So the ego has to be devastated in order for us to experience consciousness. This is the line from Rumi. You mentioned Rumi earlier. He said, love. Love, love is not a subtle argument. The door there is devastation. So love is consciousness. So he's saying in order to reach consciousness, we have to devastate everything that isn't consciousness. And that's difficult because we live with people, don't we, Matt? You know? <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, we work with people and we talk with people. And a lot of them don't take very kindly to us when we say, I don't want to gossip about that guy because it's, it, isn't, it isn't good for my soul. I don't, want to, I don't want to consume all alcohol because it's not good for my soul. I don't want to overeat and overdrink and overindulge. I don't want to shake my fist at Donald Trump in America like everybody else because it just doesn't, doesn't sate me, it just doesn't do nothing for me. So suddenly it's that around of people that knew you yesterday when you did consume all those things. Um, and suddenly you're a stranger in their company. You're not comfortable for them because you've created a proximity and they're not comfortable for you because they're outside your proximity. So it takes a very rare friend to follow you with that. A very rare friend to stay with you. As your proximity gets tighter, what I call tightening in the room, mm. you will spit people out and other people will be drawn irresistibly towards you. That's, um, that's the prize and the penalty for consciousness. And I've, I've experienced all that because I've got close yeah. and I heard you talking about that in the interview and your wife Sharon, you know, you're tightening and tightening. Yeah. She was like, are you going to kick me out? I was like, I fucking hope not. Uh, Am I gone and, as well? Yeah, you're yeah. gone as well. And I have noticed that as well. I've got close and close and came in and all the while I'm turning into myself, I'm turning into yeah. my heart where God lives. And I feel like uh, people just don't want to be there. It's not comfortable for them, you know. Yeah, uh, and that's bad. okay. I understand yeah. that. Yeah. Well, I had a, I was woken in the middle of the night once um, a couple of years ago, and I was taken out of my body. I don't know if I've told this story on any of the podcasts, but um, I was awake. I was wide awake. So it wasn't like a dream. It wasn't a vision. I was literally, I woke up. I felt uneasy. I was just like, like that, and I lay there, and I thought, what's happening to my body? 
And suddenly I felt these lights come up on my body. Ping, 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 ping. Maybe the chakra points. And I felt something open. And I was released from my body. So it went up. I was completely, completely, utterly awake. Went through a cloud. And this cloud I recognised later, this crowd, this crowd dressed me. So I was clothed in this crowd. So it enabled me to exist like a spacesuit, I suppose. Enabled me to other realm. And then suddenly I was in a crowd of people. And there was a preacher there. It was an Indian guy. And he was saying, um, you must go out and serve. You've got to serve. People will attack you. Love them. People will criticize you. Love them. People will... Uh, people will hate you for, for the fact that you want to serve. Love them anyway. And he, was just, and he was just saying to me directly, you're going to go out and you're going to serve people and you're going to talk about forgiveness and you're going to talk about personal repentance. You're going to talk about responsibility. You're going to talk about existing on nothing but kindness and people are going to attack you for it. I've, obviously, I've had a lot of that anyway over the years, even from very close friends and people I love, you know, some of my senior students um, when I started to teach love um, you know and um, started to experience this expansion you know they openly attacked me online and uh, very personal attacks and I, I, understood, I understood that the proximity will spit some out and it will draw some in and that's not my choice so but I was taken into this cloud and, I, and, and it was said um, you've got to go out and preach and, and teach and um, give love and serve. You've got to serve. People are going to attack you. Serve them anyway. People will hate you. Serve them anyway. People will revile you. Love them anyway. Um, and then I just came back down again, did my body, and I went to sleep. I woke up the next morning, and as I walked to the bathroom, I got probably, it felt like half an hour's worth of dialogue between here and the bathroom, a few feet, and it was saying the same things. Um, teach, you know, uh, serve. People will attack you for it. Love them. People will revile you. Love them. So it's kind of saying that's going to happen. That's that will happen. Those adverse forces are there. They don't want to be exposed because they're dissolved by exposure. They're consumed by exposure. You need to be courageous, and you will be protected. You will have a dharma protector here. You'll have a dharma <coughs> protector here. You will have Michael at your back. You know, you will have the soul over here in front of you as your teacher, you will have a battalion of angels around you from the angelic realm. You are protected. Stay in the center. Don't let yourself fall into fear. Don't let yourself fall into doubt. Again, this is all in the Bible. When you look at Moses taking the Israelites through the desert, who were they attacked by? Amalek, the, the tribe of Amalek. Amalek means doubt, means uncertainty. He was saying these people are finding their own sovereignty. They've been released from the the um the slavery of the egyptians and the, the egyptian was an allegory for the ego so they've been released from the ego but they're going to be attacked all the way through and if you don't listen they'll be consumed by doubt don't let yourself fall into doubt and that's why our job matt is to be in constant prayer center stay in the center these adverse forces have no business with us while we stay in the center these adverse forces have no business with us while we are cleaving to God. We sit next to the CEO. Nobody has anything to say to us. If we fall out of alignment, as Al Ghazali says, we will be noticed. So our job is to be in constant prayer. Wow. Oh, my God. That's incredible. Do you know what I absolutely loved? When you talked with the Brian Rose interview and you talked about Guy Ritchie asked you to come in, you know, and the likes of Eckhart Tolle, uh, Deepak Chopra, Sam Harris. Now, I follow a lot of those people, uh, Wayne Dyer, Brian yeah. K.E., uh, Brene Brown. But what is so special about you? And why they brought you in as the troublemaker is because <laughs> as a comment, How dare you? How do you, as a com <laughs> as a common man, Roy Jeff yeah. is you hit my soul because you're so honest, you're so raw and to the truth. You make spirituality uh, uh, accessible for me. You you make it less high brow and you muscular, bring it. Pardon? It's muscular. And you make it you make it accessible. You know, you, I hear your vernacular, I hear the way you say it permeates my soul. I get all those people. It's probably because you talk so honestly about the dark and the light. 
Yeah. You yeah. you make them both equally as uh, no value to either or. They just they're, are. They're, they're, and they're both ordained. Yeah. They're ordained. You know, there is a darkness. There is an adverse force. We are under attack. There's no doubt about that. But those are ordained forces. And if we are able to stay centered, um, those forces will be consumed in the act of our volition. So those forces will be converted from darkness to light through us. And that's the main reason we're here, to convert those, to, to convert those forces. But of course, it's, if, if, we're, if these forces rise to claim or be claimed, if we don't claim them, if we don't convert them, we've seen what happens. You know, they overtake us and people fall into corruption. People fall into anger. People fall into the Amalek, the doubt. Mm. So the job, once you get that, is to, like a tightrope water, walker, you've got to stay on that line. You've got to stay concentrated. These forces, it's their job. It's their job to give you a divine shock if you fall out of alignment. You are in possession of the soul. It is a very, very highly valued piece of treasure. And it is massively corrupted by negative forces. So we must protect it. We have to have an army around us. In, in Buddhism, they say that when you reach a certain level, you will be awarded two Dharma protectors. Dharma means the law. You know, this is all the stuff we're talking about. These Dharma protectors will um, shield you and they will provide for you. Not only will they protect you from negative forces, they will also provide for you. They'll, they'll, you know, they'll help you to find your rent. They'll give you a means of transport. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll supply your supper. You know, so they, when we think things are useless and we can't find enough money or we can't, you know, we're struggling about making our ends meet, um, these things will be found for us. Our, our needs will be met. But you have to get to a certain level of cleansing before that happens. But these forces are very natural. It's when Brian said to me, why are these forces there? And I said, well, when you go into a gym to develop a physique, a physique why are there weights and why is there gravity? Because the weights and the gravity combined help you to develop a refined physique. And if you're a Dorian that. Yates... I love Dorian there, Yates, by the yeah, way. My favourite bodybuilder. Well, I've met him a couple of times. and He's a legend. Uh, he sent a few messages to me and I've sent a few messages back and I, I love him. But what I love about Dorian is that he goes into the gym, he finds the burn quickly, he stays in the burn long, he doesn't pontificate, you don't have a conversation with him about it. Um, and he's not making big announcements about it. He just does the work. And he's, he's found, he found a singularity with his weight training. And he was able to, he was, his physique was so exceptional that when he went to competitions, if they didn't award him the, the first prize, there would have been riots because he was so clearly high and above everybody else. But it's because he absolutely dedicated his life to that. Well, our relationship with God is the same. It demands that we, we, we're either in it or we're not. We can't, can't be Sunday, you know, uh, you know, just attending church on a Sunday and a Tuesday. We've got to live it and breathe it. We've got to wake up with it and we've got to talk to God all day and we've got to go to bed with it. And we've got to recognize that although other people will look at us and think we've, we're socks and sandals or we're dream catchers, they won't recognize how muscular and how demanding and how courageous you have to be to live that kind of life because it is it isn't the the it isn't the revealed torah that people pontificate about this is the hidden torah which is very um hugely challenging if you're not prepared for it you know it's hugely hugely challenging it would go through you like fire this force it'd be like it'd be like putting a thousand volts to a hundred watt light bulb it wouldn't he just wouldn't be able to cope with it so we have to we have to um, prepare the infrastructure, and that's with all the stuff we were talking about. You know, this is a, I've just written a book called The Divine CEO, which is all about this process and all about what I've learned, and still I'm, I'm still learning, of course. I just bought it last night, that and uh, from no, uh, what notes from a factory. Draw. Yeah, I bought the two of them last night and a bag of a Gita. Oh, fantastic, fantastic! So I can't wait till they come out. Come here. I know I said we'd only be an hour. Now we're nearly an hour and 20 minutes. Uh, I'm sorry about this. Can no, I ask you? Fine. I, I'm so excited about this interview. It's like a dog with two Mickeys. <laughs> <laughs> before we go, before we wrap up, what is the one thing you would like people to take away after listening to this interview? Be kind. This, you know, people have got this idea about big esoteric exercises, but be kind. Just try it. Try it for a day. See how hard it is. 
be kind. If you've got nothing kind to say, say nothing. You know, be kind to the reflection in the mirror. Be kind in your own internal dialogue. Be kind in your interactions with everybody, especially when they're challenging. That's a good place to start. And if you don't, if you can't be kind, then observe the part of you that isn't kind, because the part of you that isn't kind isn't the real you. So if you're able to look at your unkindnesses, they will eventually lead you back to the center where the observer or the witness is witnessing this. So we're creating in the world all the time, um, whether we whether we know it or not, we're creating from either goodness or from negativity. So we have a choice. Reality exists at the level of engagement. If we don't engage negativity, it has no life. But of course, we're so used to engaging negativity, it just comes in, we engage it, it, it incarnates us, and then it acts, as, it acts through us in the world. And then, of course, like, like uh, the respectable um, Dr. Jekyll, he's always having to pick up the bill for the disrespectful Mr. Hyde. So we're always having to pick up the bill for things we did when we were out of character, when we were not ourselves. So if you can't be kind, at least observe the part of you that isn't kind and recognize that that has left a presence in the world and that presence in the world will at some point create and come back to you. So just be kind. Start. That's the first exercise to start with. Be kind. Try it for a day. It's very difficult. Even when you understand it, it's very difficult because we're so bombarded all the time with unkindness. But these unkind thoughts, these unkind energies can be converted into goodness, into love. So if we trace back all the unkindness and don't engage them, they will eventually lead us to the singularity, which is the observer, which is observing all of these phenomena around us. So the key then is to sit in the center, observe from the center and be the gatekeeper, be the bouncer. Don't let shit in the club and then wonder, wonder why it's kicking off an hour later. You, you, knock, you knock it back at the door. We've got the perfect example with doorman because the doorman is like what we need to be. We need to protect the doorway to the heart. And the heart in the Old Testament is the will. So we have to protect the doorway to our will. Otherwise, negativity comes in. It takes over our will. It kicks off. It upsets our wife. We kick the dog. You know, we're, we're unkind with the children. We have a few pints and stick our fingers up at the television. And then the next day we wake up and think, I've got, to, I've got to pick up the pieces from all that now. You know, so we can't afford to lose our will. We can't afford to give our will over to the first force that knocks on the door. When we were doing the door, people paid us four times the, the, the hourly rate of a factory worker so that we could protect the good people from the bad people and the indifferent from themselves. We did that by standing on the door and uh, creating a filter so that only the positive people could come in. And the other people were rejected. That's what we were paid for. We just got to do exactly the same with the doorway to the will. Wow, 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 wow. Oh, man, that's unbelievable. I want to thank you, Jeff, from the bottom of my heart for being a gift from the universe. Thanks very much for your kindness. Uh, it's amazing. You are everything about kindness. You live it. It's true what they say. you got to be what you want to become. And you are the epitome of kindness. I want to thank my pal Aoife for the gift of sending me you. I've never heard of you before. And then all of a sudden she sends me a podcast with you on it and you've just blown my world. Uh, thank you. I'll end by saying, I read a quote by CEO, and if I get this right, freedom is not in the external life. Did I get that right? Freedom is not in the external yeah. life. Yeah. Is that turning into your heart, turning yeah. inside, yeah. Into, the, into the spiritual? Yeah, there's no freedom outside outside is just a projection it's about finding the freedom inside and freedom is the singularity freedom is is accessing your authentic self your true self so that's 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 Eckhart Tolle would would call the observer or the witness Eckhart Tolle wrote a great book called the power of now Read it. it's probably the best book in the world at the moment for this technique it's about right. locating the observer and that's your singularity that's yourself that is the geometric point for your life a geometric point is the point where all creation comes from. So all our creation needs to come from one single place, which is the self. It doesn't need to come from the 10 personalities that overtake us every single day when we have too many beers or we look at a bare ankle, you know what I mean? And another personality comes up. We've got to be single. We've got to have a singularity. In science, they would call that the quantum vacuum. And once we've created that proximity, if people look into the face of 
the, of a person who's looked into the face of God, they will also be looking into the face of God. If they stand in the proximity of someone who's standing in the proximity of God, they too will be in the proximity of God. And that's why people will be drawn to you or people will be repelled. Because if they've got negativity in them, it will blow them away. And if they've got positivity, positivity in them, it will draw them in. Wow. Jeff, you're a special person. Thanks very much. Love and kindness to you, you and Sharon. You're such an angel. Thanks a lot. Thank Namaste. So bad. See you later. Okay. Thanks very much. Jeff, that was absolutely fucking brilliant. Fucking ah, thank hell. You. Where did the time go? We'd lost, we disappeared. It was brilliant. Oh, fuck. I could have talked to you forever. It's like I said, I was like, I seen an hour coming up. I was like, I fucking said it'll be an hour. Now it's an hour and a half. I, I just, I could have talked to you forever. I was You're okay in my head. I've, I've got an hour and a half set. To, I've got to meet my daughter in a bit. So in my head, an hour and a half was fine anyway. So okay. I know if I go over an hour and a half, I end, normally end up just repeating stuff. And I, I think it's better to keep it. An yeah. hour and a half is just about right for people, I think. We don't want to give them too much because it can be overwhelming. Yeah, yeah. How was all that for you? Was that okay? Everything yeah, happy enough great. for that? Yeah, You've got a great energy. I, the message you sent with me was so beautiful. It was, it was so lovely and heartfelt. I just felt it. And because my heritage is Irish as well, I always, I always feel at home when I hear an Irish accent. You know, my, my poetry... Um, and my articulation and my storytelling is from my Irish heritage. I absolutely know that. So yeah. uh, no, there was something about you, about what you're doing, um, about what you said, and I just it was it was just full of richness. So I just so it was a real pleasure to come and talk with you, Matt. Brilliant. And I'm in the process of trying to write a book myself. It's called From My Head to My Heart. I have it kind of put together. I'm just trying to start to publish it now. So it's it's amazing that I'm even talking to you. Well, uh, get, and that's you inspired me. Once you get a publisher, if you think it'll help, contact me. Once you've got a deal, contact me. And I'll, if you want me to, I'll write a foreword for you. Oh, you're fucking gent. Thanks very much, man. I really appreciate it. You can My... get it. Get it out then. Share your story in, in print. It'd be brilliant. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks very much. Love and kindness to you. Have a great day. Mind your little self. Thanks, Matt.